and it has a second effect. When they sell Israel advanced weaponry, uh, the rulers of the Gulf states say, we want some too. It's kind of like a teaser in a, a department store. Uh, they say, look, we want some of the goodies too, and then Lockheed Martin and the rest of them can send uh, huge amounts of uh, second-rate military equipment to Saudi Arabia, which they can't do anything with. Uh, and it's uh, you know, nowhere near what they sell to Israel, and, but it's a lot of money coming back to them. So that's great. Uh, calling on an arms embargo against Israel and Egypt, for that matter, second largest recipient of American aid. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, and I think those are realistic prospects. You know, the, 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 the uh, sanctions movement, if it's done properly, I mean, it can be done badly, but if it's done properly, it's it can be significant. And there are other options open now. And Israel's very much concerned about them, so is the U.S. That's one of the reasons for the Paramount Way, I feel, you know, that they feel there's a movement attempting to delegitimize them. Well, it's not delegitimizing them, it's delegitimizing their criminal actions. How resistant is the, uh, is the U.S. to a uh, nuclear weapons free zone? Is that mm -hmm. nuclear no. we That's a very good question. And it's right on the international agenda. Uh, the Non-Proliferation Treaty Conference that was held a couple of weeks ago, uh, one of the main things that came out of it was an international call for a nuclear weapons-free zone in the Middle East. Now, if the U.S. had any interest in ending nuclear proliferation, if Obama believed the word he was saying, uh, he would be calling for nuclear weapons-free zones all over the world. It's not a complete solution to proliferation, but it's a pretty significant one. Instead, the U.S. is doing the exact opposite. It, in this case, the administration was kind of caught because it couldn't come out openly and say, say, well, no, we don't want a nuclear weapons-free zone. That's uh, too obvious. <coughs> so what they did was they said, well, yes, we agree with the world. We want a nuclear weapons-free zone, but it has to wait until there's a comprehensive peace treaty. Okay, it means until the Messiah comes. Uh, and we can block a comprehensive peace treaty exactly the way can do it for 35 years. So yes, we're all in favor of it, it's a wonderful idea, but it's got to wait until we get a comprehensive peace treaty, which we can continue to block just the way we've been blocking it. And the United States further stated that it's not going to accept anything that either restricts uh, Israeli nuclear activities or that calls upon uh, major powers, meaning the United States, to reveal what they know about nuclear, Israeli nuclear uh, facilities. So they're saying, well, we can't accept any treaty that forces us to tell what we know. Uh, the Security Council, the, the Security uh, Asian Security Group, the, the CICA, that just met a couple of days ago, they reiterated that again. And in fact, the world has been strongly calling for a nuclear weapons free zone in the region. And, uh, it's never reported, but uh, it's worth bearing in mind that the U.S. and Britain have a unique commitment to that, unique commitment for reasons that can't be reported but are very straight. When the U.S. and Britain invaded Iraq, they tried to construct a kind of a thin legal cover for it. And the way they did it was by appealing to a Security Council resolution from 1991. Resolution 687, if you want to look it up. Uh, and the, with that resolution in 1991, called upon Saddam Hussein to eliminate his weapons of mass destruction programs. Uh, that was the pretext for the invasion, as you recall. Okay, we don't have to worry about the nature of the pretext. That was pretty well exploded. But that resolution is interesting. You go to Article 14 of that resolution and read it. It commits the signers to establishing a nuclear weapons free zone in the Middle East. Okay, that means the U.S. and Britain, over all other countries, are formally committed to this. Okay. Now, they can get away with it because the media and the educated classes keep quiet. Now, that doesn't mean we have to keep quiet. Now, we can say, yeah, you guys are really committed to that. Uh, and therefore, your efforts to evade it are, you know, can't be tolerated. But quite apart from the fact that if it was instituted, it would mitigate and perhaps eliminate uh, any 
possible threat that Iran might pose. Not much of a threat, as I mentioned at the beginning, whatever it is, so that would eliminate that. Uh, so, yeah, it's a very positive step. Uh, the U.S. is blocking it. Uh, but remember that the Obama administration is blocking every other nuclear weapons free zone at the same time. Also, it doesn't get recorded. That's quite important. Like Africa, it just after a lot of years of negotiation, finally reached agreement on a nuclear weapons free zone. There's only one hang up the U.S. won't allow. Uh, Africa includes an island in the Indian Ocean, Cape de Garcia. It was a British territory, and at U.S. orders, the British expelled the population. Uh, and uh, turned it into an American military base, one of the main military bases. It's functioning. That's the military base that the U.S. uses to bomb the Middle East and Central Asia and so on. That's a major base. And the U.S. stores nuclear weapons there. And that's going up under the Obama administration. In fact, in December, uh, the, the Navy announced that it's sending a submarine tender to Diego Garcia to uh, to uh, accommodate the nuclear submarines with nuclear tip missiles in Diego Garcia. Uh, Obama announced that he's uh, sending to Diego Garcia uh, what are called bunker busters, the most lethal weapon in the arsenal short of nuclear weapons that are designed for attacking Iran. Uh, this is being built up there. So the U.S. will not allow the African nuclear weapons free zone to proceed because it wants to use it for nuclear weapons. Same thing's happening in the South Pacific. The South Pacific countries also reached a, an agreement on a nuclear weapons free zone. Well, at first that was blocked by France because France wanted to use its French island possessions for testing nuclear weapons. Okay, that's done. They carried out the tests and that's over. Now the U.S. is blocking it because the U.S. island possessions, possessions are used for storing nuclear weapons for the passage of nuclear submarines. So that nuclear weapons free zone is gone. But the most important one is the Middle East. And uh, uh, that's a really critical one. It's a major issue. Uh, there is a the Nuclear Proliferation Treaty Conference, the review conference a couple of weeks ago, ended up, and the U.S. kind of blocked the decision there, but it did end up with a call for a conference, I think in 2012, to consider this issue, to focus on this issue. And the U.S. is going to be in a kind of a bind thing, because that's going to be the world, you know, calling for a nuclear weapons-free zone, and the U.S. having to try to figure out a way to evade it. A nuclear weapons-free zone would not only include Israel, U.S. allies, but it would include U.S. forces. I mean, any U.S. forces deployed, deployed couldn't use nuclear weapons. And Obama's new strategic posture, uh, if you read it carefully, uh, has says, okay, we won't use nuclear weapons against non-nuclear uh, weapons states, with an exception. Iran or anybody else is in the way. There we can use nuclear weapons even against the state without nuclear weapons. So, you know, they're probably deployed in, in the region. So these, these are major issues. I mean, if anybody really cared about nuclear proliferation, they'd be focusing on those. I have a question about BDS, the BDS strategy. Uh, aside from the military and security and telecommunications sectors, which are heavily subsidized by the Defense Department, uh, what other sectors of the U.S. economy are heavily invested in Israel and the occupied territories? The Caterpillar. Um, Caterpillar is, uh, uh, somebody mentioned Rachel Corey before. Rachel Corey was killed by Caterpillar, um, one of these huge Caterpillar bulldozers or something. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Caterpillar is supplying the weapons returning the occupied territories and the deserts. Uh, that's in violation of international law. You know. And uh, boycotting Caterpillar makes a lot of sense. In fact, boycotting any American company that's involved in the occupied territories is not only proper, but even legal. Mm -hmm. Just the same is true of boycotting the products that come from the West Bank. I have a second part to that. Do you also support cultural and academic boycotts and divestments? Well, so like boycotting dance groups and things like that. Or academic universities. Academic institutions. Yeah. I don't myself. Okay. And frankly, even in the case of South Africa, I, I didn't agree with it. Okay. Uh, in the case of Israel, I, I don't agree with it, first of all, in principle, but also just tactically. 
I mean, if you, if you want to think, if, if you want to be serious about any action, you know, whether men, uh, whatever it may be, uh, you first have to ask yourself, am I carrying this out because I want to feel good, or am I carrying it out because I care about the victims? And that leads to different decisions. So maybe the weathermen felt that you know, they felt good breaking windows, but that wasn't helping the Vietnamese. And the Vietnamese didn't like it. In fact, what the Vietnamese wanted was uh, peaceful demonstrations. Uh, but it sort of felt good to break windows. And the same is true of this. Uh, if you, forgetting all questions of principle, if you decide to boycott Tel Aviv University, why not boycott Harvard? And then at MIT, you know, we're guilty of far worse crimes. Uh, and the hypocrisy is so great that it just turns into a, a giving a, putting a weapon in the hands of the most hardline elements. They can say, look, you guys are total hypocrites. Mm -hmm. Why are you why are you attacking Israel? Why not yourselves? Or, for example, there's uh, talk now about uh, There's, there's all kinds of proposals like that. You just have to look at every one of them and see exactly what its consequences are. I mean, if you're serious about activism, and you think seriously about tactics, tactics are important, and you can't just follow them because it makes us feel good. You have to follow them because it's going to help the victims, not harm them. And in some cases like these, I think it harms them. And I think you clear, clear examples of that. But I can give you one example right here. Cambridge. A couple of years ago, there was a Harvard MIT uh, petition. Uh, it was for a good purpose. It was uh, protesting the massacres in Janin. But it was formulated in a way which allowed the hardline elements to emphasize the hypocrisy of it, which was there for these reasons. So what happened is that Cambridge was then consumed for a couple of months by the crucially important issue of anti-Semitism at Harvard. You know, Larry Summers, the president, made a big speech about anti-Semitism at Harvard. It's one that I talked about for a couple of months. Uh, Janine was forgotten. Okay, that's not a help for uh, the Palestinians. You have to think about what you're doing and what the consequences are. That's quite apart from questions of principle. It's just a narrow attack of the ground. Mm -hmm. I think the BDS movement often doesn't take that seriously enough. Um, at the Australian academic Clive Hamilton has recently written a book, uh, Requiem for a Species, which I think I saw you actually commended. Um, a couple of times tonight, or this, today, you've touched on environmental catastrophe, um, biblical end times, these sorts of themes. I mean, do, for a lot of people, I think we may be freezing up, or we're looking for a profit, or we're, uh, people are, um, you know, wondering what the hell to do. Is there actually a technical problem that we need to solve, or is it a social problem? It's both. I mean, the climate change, uh, to deal with climate change, you know, the details you can argue about, mm. but there's hardly any serious doubt that mm. anthropogenic climate change is taking place. Mm. And could have a, very serious effect. Mm. Uh, that leads to social problems and technical problems. Mm. Uh, the, and the technical problems, for example, probably the most far-reaching one is to find ways to uh, use solar energy, mm. you know, the one ultimate renewable endless mm -hmm. resource mm -hmm. uh, for uh, uh, energy on Earth. And there are ideas about it. I mean, I'm not technically competent to judge them, but, uh, you know, I know guys in the engineering department at MIT who are serious scientists who think it's feasible to, uh, and I have long articles about this, to put uh, a satellite, to put the uh, dishes in receptors in, in space outside hmm. the Earth's atmosphere uh, in orbit. Out. So they get solar energy without any uh, uh, disruption. Hmm. and to use microwaves and the techniques to get it to Earth and then distribute it you know, it's possible and to hmm. it from the local source of energy. All right, maybe that's the right answer, maybe something else is. But whatever it is, it's sophisticated technology. And that's going to have to be, 
that or something like it's going to have to be part of the solution. On the other hand, there are social problems. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the United States, particularly, it's worth remembering that there have been a massive social engineering problems, mm -hmm. uh, projects in the United States since the Second World War mm -hmm. to uh, drive the economy towards uh, uh, inefficient use of fossil fuels. It's actually, you know, it's conspiracies. In fact, some of them went to court and were fined for conspiracy. Uh, the U.S. used to have uh, pretty efficient electric rail systems. We used to be able to get around New England with uh, electric rail. Uh, Los Angeles, this is now a monstrosity, had a very efficient uh, electric rail system. Well, all of these things were destroyed by state corporate programs, very conscious programs, to try to drive the economy towards uh, massive, wasteful use of fossil fuels. Some of them were actually went to court. The mm -hmm. corporation defined for conspiracy tap the notice. Uh, the uh, uh, other massive social engineering projects uh, drove the population out of the cities into the suburbs. Mm -hmm. you know, all kind of inducements to go to the suburbs mm -hmm. to destroy the cities. Mm -hmm. oh, well, you know, I don't object to living in the suburbs. In fact, I do I kind of like it. But uh, it's. Uh, <laughs> From the point of view of an economy, it's just crazy. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't live in the suburbs where I live, not far from Boston, without having two cars and a family. Mm -hmm. I'm like the nearest public transportation is a couple miles away, and that rarely comes. Uh, there's also uh, racist issues. So, for example, where I live, that's the western suburbs of Boston. Uh, there was a proposal back in the 70s to extend the subway system out to the western suburbs which interestingly would have saved people where I live a couple hours of commuting time every day. But people, you know, wealthy, it's a progressive suburb, everybody votes for the government, that sort of thing. But people living there prefer to spend two hours fighting Boston traffic uh, rather than facing the threat that some black kid from Dorchester might walk around Lexington Center. <laughs> so no subway, so therefore we fight traffic all well, you know, those are major social problems. They're all over the country. Mm -hmm. And those things have to be dealt with somehow. Mm -hmm. You cannot have a uh, society geared to uh, maximal waste of fossil fuels and expect it to survive. Mm -hmm. So there's both significant social problems and uh, straight technological problems which have to be dealt up with somehow. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, <clears throat> go going back, I know this is a little while ago, but going back to this gentleman's uh, question right here about um, our currency system, it, it seems that our economy and our currency is, um, it has certain properties that, that manifest certain behaviors, and it seems that our currency is designed in such a way that uh, with interest and with it being lent in through, uh, through debt, that, you know, y you can accrue wealth by virtue of just having wealth. And, um, do you think that there's any value as a sort of uh, strategy for dealing with that? Do you think there's any value in working class people and in citizens using alternative, local, or sort of, you know, uh, differently valued currencies to directly exchange and create value amongst themselves as opposed to capitulating to an economy that's not designed to serve their needs in the first place, which some people are doing around the nation with various degrees of success and failure? I think it's almost impossible. I mean, we live in a complex society, actually, a global society. And how you can get along without uh, a currency system of roughly the kind we have, I don't understand. Yes, you could have a local currency system for Boston, but let's suppose you take a trip to New York, okay, the way you do it. Uh, plus the fact that you could never accumulate the reserves that allow you to borrow enough money to finance a car, let's say. And it's just not going to work. These are not... I, I don't think that... There is a lot of talk about the currency system. I think it's misguided. I mean, there's a lot of things wrong with it, I'm sure. Like the Fed, for example, is owned by banks. The Fed does not meet its legal requirements. The Fed, is, by law, is supposed to be geared towards full employment. They, they don't do that. You know, they're geared towards the needs of the banks who pretty much on them, not too much inflation. 
Uh, so yes, there are things wrong with the currency system, but replacing it by kind of local currencies of the kind that the country had back in the 19th century, I think, you can see how it could work. I don't think that's the real problem. Um, since a few years back, Venezuela has made efforts to export the Bolivarian Revolution. Uh, to export the Bolivarian Revolution um, to, I think it was about nine different countries, including uh, Cuba, Bolivia, and other Caribbean, South American countries. Um, and they have, they proposed even uh, to implement a new currency, the Sucre, which whether it works or not is neither here nor there, but I'm wondering whether that alliance could, in your opinion, do you think it, it could culminate into you know, a, a significant enough power eventually to, to the degree of um, moving beyond an oil-based economy? I don't think so. Well, maybe it's a good idea in some abstract sense, but in the real world, I can't imagine how it would be. I mean, for example, it doesn't include the major economy in South America, the dynamo of South America, for sure. Yeah. Uh, it includes, it's not really exporting any kind of revolution. It's calling for other institutions that would be independent from the U.S. dominated ones. But it can't even begin to approach the scale that would make a difference as far as I can see. I mean, there are good things, like the Petro Caribe, so, you know, giving low-cost oil to, uh, say, Haiti, places like that. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, the uh, um, border exchange with Cuba makes sense. Cuba and Venezuela are each pursuing their comparative advantage. I see the economists don't like it. Uh, Cuba's providing uh, trained personnel, you know, doctors, teachers, and so on. That's their comparative advantage. Uh, Venezuela's providing oil. It's their comparative advantage. Uh, people who study economics are a cheer. Uh, but it's nothing, you know, that's just conventional economics. There's no revolution associated with it. And uh, those countries are just not in a position to uh, create an alternative. I mean, th there are, you know, it's good that Latin America is moving towards independent institutions, you know, like uh, UNASUR and uh, America uh, you know, the, the organization of Latin American states that was just formed without the U.S. But those moves are all moves in the right direction, I think, but you know, unless they include the major Latin American countries, they're not going to get off the ground, at least for Brazil. Yeah. Earlier, you were talking about the Adam Smith kind of policy and the mafia policy principle, and I'm just wondering, it seems like, like the mafia principle would always win. I mean, it would, any economic policy is going to fall in line with the mafia policy if it's going to work, uh, whether whether it's short term or long term. Like maybe it falls in line um, in the long term. It doesn't look like it does in the short term. But are, are there any Sometimes examples? It doesn't. So in fact, I mentioned a couple of cases where it conflicts with the, you know, the Adam Smith principle, right. the obvious principle that the people who own the country pretty much run the policies. Right. Okay, sometimes it conflicts. Well, well, I'm just saying, so it conflicts, but it seems like the mafia principle would always win out. Not I'm necessarily. Sure there that no, the cases case. where pursuing uh, the narrow parochial interests of uh, major sectors of the economy wins out over efforts around the world. But that would be short term. Short -term. Like in the long term, the mafia principle is going to win out because you can lose control. I don't think you can really say much. These, these things depend on marginal factors of decision making which are pretty hard to take. Even the individuals involved can't predict it. Like for example, should you continue the policy of punishing Cubans? I, mean, I don't know if they're there have been moments in recent American history where, especially under the Carter administration, where moves were made towards you know, improving relations and Reagan came in their back off. But there are a lot of factors, some of them personally influence these and doubt that you can make a, you can find principles that are operative and they usually coincide, but there are cases where they conflict, which are instructive. 
and in real international relations theory, that's what people would study. But I just don't believe you're going to find you know, deep principles determining any of this. Too, too much complexity. Um, there's a lot of talk everywhere except in the U.S. press about the apartheid regime in the occupied territories. I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about the racist laws inside Israel proper inside Israel. and what impact they might have on a potential two-state solution given the demographic issue. And, and well, you see, I don't think the demographic issue is ever going to arise. I think that's an illusion of Palestinians and supporters of Palestine. Israel's policies and with the U.S. backing them, like the convergence programs. But they don't leave any demographic problems. Uh, Israel's taking over areas that have practically no Arabs. Uh, so the Arabs can be off somewhere in Iraq. Okay. So there won't be a demographic problem. Uh, the Palestinians, uh, the people who talk about one state, are just pursuing illusions. You know, they're following pretty reasonable policies which are going to prevent any demographic problem. In fact, it might be even worse than that. Now, there is a proposal, uh, it was, was proposed by Victor Lieberman, a you know, kind of ultra right wing nationalist, uh, as a foreign minister, uh, to take the uh, areas in Israel of heavy Arab population density, Wadi Ara, the region, which includes the Mufaha, the biggest Arab city, and just forcibly remove it from Israel and force it into the West Bank. Well, that, when that was proposed, it was called neo-Nazi. Of course, the people there strongly oppose it. They don't want to, they've been bold and studied. They, they don't want to move from a rich first world country into a non-existent uh, you know, territory that may not be able to survive. But who cares about them? Uh, so it was, yes, properly called a neo-Nazi uh, program. Uh, by now, it's a centrist program. Uh, it's been taken over by Kadima, you know, the centrist party, uh, Tsipi Livni, who's the uh, hope of the doves, she's advocated it. Uh, New York Times advocates it. The New York Times described it as a very positive proposal, which ought to uh, satisfy the, uh, the doves who are left because it's moving towards two state settlement. And in fact, if you look at the history of it, it goes back to a highly respected uh, U.S. Uh, scholar who's considered a liberal humanist and a spokesman for democratic socialism, Michael Walser. He's a professor at the Institute for Advanced Studies, the, uh, the democratic socialist theoretician. But he proposed back in the early 70s that, uh, he put it rather politely, he said, the, uh, he said uh, creating a nation is a difficult process and sometimes those who are marginal to the nation meaning Palestinians, have to be helped to move just out of humanity. So since the Palestinians are marginal to the nation and their country, they have to be helped to move. Okay, that's the neo-Nazi policy that uh, I think the Lieberman goes back to a uh, uh, highly respected American democratic socialists. Uh, but uh, that might be done, and that would reduce the democratic problem even further. So I don't think there's... I don't think there's going to be a demographic problem. I mean, there's another demographic problem inside Israel, and that's the high birth rate of the religious sector. Uh, that's a, it has a big effect on the country. Uh, things you can say about that. But what about the racist laws inside Israel? Well, that's a very interesting topic. Um, the most extreme of them is uh, was the land laws. Uh, there have been land laws inside Israel that should in various devious ways, and place about 90% of the country in the hands of an organization uh, which is, uh, by law, by its contract with the State of Israel, is required to act solely in the interests of, I'm quoting, people of Jewish race, religion, and origin. That's the Jewish National Fund. That's a tax-free institution in the United States, which means that every American is funding an institution committed to act in the interests of people of Jewish race, religion, and origin, which through various arrangements controlled 90% of the country. That's pretty serious. Nobody can talk about that. You know, 
I bet it's utterly outrageous. Uh, I've written about it for instance, a lot of people have. Well, actually, that's, you know, there is a civil libertarian movement in this world. And finally, in the year 2000, it's, uh, act, act, are you sure? It's called ACRI, A-C-R-A-I, I forget what it stands for, Association for the Civil Rights Initiative or something like that. But they managed to get the High Court to consider this. And the High Court concluded that it's, you know, it's, 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 in, it's illegal, it's un, untenable. You can't have a law that blocks 92% uh, of the land from Arab citizens, non citizens. So they struck it down. It was in a particular case, one town, that's here, where a middle class uh, Arab family was trying to move in, and the town rejected their application on grounds of land laws. So the court struck that down. Well, about six years later, they were finally allowed to move in. As far as I know, that's the only case where the law has been applied. Uh, there are other cases since then where various devious means were devised to keep them out, but like, they're not compatible with the nature of the community and so on. Um, people in America are perfectly familiar with this. This is their whole history. I mean, I've been through it. I remember when my wife and I were, uh, couldn't pay the rents in Cambridge anymore, and we were trying to move into the suburbs, and we looked around. There's one suburb which we kind of liked, so we asked the real estate agent to was there anything for sale there? And he looked at us and said, you wouldn't be happy here. <laughs> Which means they don't allow Jews in. Uh, and, you know, there are various ways to do this kind of thing. It's entirely familiar in the United States. And yeah, that's going on in Israel. Okay, these are problems. But these problems are them to deal with. I mean, we don't have anything to say about them. We have a, such a horrible history. We have no right to say anything. Uh, but uh, it's a real problem. And there are other laws like that. But those are kind of internal problems for Israel, not worse than other countries. Uh, Europe has horrible laws. Uh, so we, and, uh, it's not a matter for international boycotts. It's just a boycott everywhere in the world, including yourself. Uh, but the, the question of apartheid arises in the occupied territories. And I don't think it's the right term, because what's going on there is much worse than apartheid. So it's a gift to Israel to call it apartheid, for the reasons I mentioned. Bantu stance is not the right word. Uh, they don't want Bantu stance. They want the people out. What term would you use? It's plain racism. Imperialism. It's plain imperialism. It's settler colonialism. Let's get rid of the indigenous population. It's our history. We're the prime settler colonial society. Australia is another one. They also exterminated the indigenous population. Uh, most imperialism leaves the indigenous population there and you know, tries to rule over them and exploit them and so on. But settler colonialism, which is the worst kind, it exterminates them. Uh, well, Israel can't exterminate them. You can't do that in the 20th century and get away with it. Uh, so just like Diane said, make the situation so hot and not totally. I want to see uh, Mustafa Barghouti talk last week, okay. last month. I want to see Mustafa Barghouti talk last month. Mm -hmm. And he gave his position on why uh, nonviolent resistance is the way to, to go. Do you think it is working? Actually, when I was blocked from going to Palestine, it was at his invitation. I was, you know, I mean, he was the person who issued the invitation for the Brazil University. And I think he's right. I think he's been right all along. They should have, the Palestinians made a serious er error, in my opinion. And I'm not the only one. I have to lock it. I have to talk into it to others. Uh, by, uh, uh, accepting the arena of military conflict, which is just from a tactic, forgetting any ethical principle, it makes absolutely no sense to enter into a confrontation where the enemy has all the power. Now for Israel, military confrontation is great. They're going to smash an enemy. Uh, the strength of the Palestinians would have been a nonviolent resistance. And there's some of it. And it was limited enough so that Israel could crush it. And it got Nonviolent resistance can't work unless it has some support. 
somewhere, uh, either in the oppressive society or the outside world. So what was done was pretty much crushed. But if it got to enough scale, it, it could succeed. And I don't think anything else can. Certainly not the violence. No, that's Israel's story. Yeah, um, Toronto is going to be hosting the G20 at the end of this month, um, also the G8 the, the week before, and I understand that this is going to be the last time the G8 uh, meets, mm -hmm. and so I'm wondering, one, what you think about actually three parts to this. So that's the first question. The second question is, um, to the extent that the G20 was created to undermine social movements opposition, how effective has that been? And what do you think the, the challenges are there? And three, there's, I think, in movements, been a lot of debate about the value of, you know, anti-summit convergences. Mm -hmm. There's been, within movements over the past decade, since like the height of anti-globalization stuff on this continent, um, debates about the value of convergence opposition. So like focusing on summits and these meetings as opportunities to build social movements, so I'm wondering also what you think about that. Well, you know, the shift from G8 to G20, I mean, there's actually a prior shift from G1 to G3, and then G3 to G8, and now G8 to G20. And it's a reflection of the increasing diversity of world power. I mean, you just can't exclude any longer the countries like, uh, you know, China, India, Brazil, uh, uh, South Africa. They're just too important. So, and they're forming their own organizations, uh, which are active. They don't compare with the U.S., but they're doing things. Like this Asian uh, grouping that I mentioned, that's independent of the United States. The United States is not part of it. And they meet. I mean, they're kind of not permitted into the Western discourse, but they're there. You know. uh, a very important one is uh, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. It's China-based. It includes uh, Russia, uh, India, India's an observer. It includes uh, Central Asian states. And potentially, it, it includes Pakistan as an observer, Iran as an observer. It blocks, blocked the United States. The United States was rejected. Uh, it's already passed resolutions opposing uh, any U.S. military bases in Central Asia. Not trivial. Uh, and it's, you know, it's based on China and Russia. Uh, little countries, uh, and plenty of resources and so on. But they're doing it kind of quietly, but it's a growing power system which could be kind of like NATO, which is based in Shanghai, and China, and Russia, and probably India. Well, okay, uh, the world is just getting more diverse, so it's going up to G20, and it will probably have to go beyond. But what about uh, protesting it? Well, I don't see any particular point protesting G20, but I think one can use the opportunity to educate about what's called globalization. The globalization is a, it's an ideological notion. It's not a descriptive one. I mean, the, the term globalization just means international integration. Uh, the strongest proponents of globalization are the people who lead the World Social Forum. I and mean, those are people from all over the world, you know, very walk of life, you know, peasants, uh, workers, all sorts of people who are interested in international integration. They're called anti-globalization. The reason is that the terminology is appropriated by the powerful, of course. And so for them, globalization means investor rights agreements. That's globalization. So NAFTA, for example, is globalization because it uh, works for investor rights. But uh, we don't have to accept that. And we should say, yeah, we're the ones who favor globalization. Or we think international integration is a great thing. We should be able to speak. And I think the G20, the demonstrations can uh, uh, press that message. It means uh, you know, attacking the propaganda system, right? It's cool. <sighs> <laughs>